This time, Austin, if you would please come forward. We're going to be reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And I'm not sure if we have this one up on the screen back there. Do we have that up on the screen? So if you will, please turn in your Bibles to, first, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll be reading verses 1 through 5. All please rise for a reading of God's holy word. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and the deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. But of their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Would you please pray over this reading? Dear God, thank you for giving us your word. And please help it to work in our hearts today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we say very pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now this is something I always found somewhat convicting when I read through this passage. Now Paul talks about the churches in Macedonia. Now, we don't actually have a letter to the churches in Macedonia. Now, the reason why we don't have a letter is whenever Paul gave a letter, it was a letter of correction. When he was lifting up the churches, he would speak of their wonderful blessings, what they were doing well, but Paul was an instructor. Paul would correct and instruct when they needed, and it doesn't seem that there was too much to correct in Macedonia. He speaks of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And he says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now that's a... That's a handful of words right there. But they had an abundance of joy and their deep poverty. Now, that sentence itself, we don't always fit together. We don't always think of having deep poverty and abundance of joy. We typically think of looking out in the world, the rich man on his yacht having the perfect life. Or the person who has a billion dollars living greatly. And in our minds we often think of, say, the homeless man on the street and their pain and their suffering. We don't always connect deep poverty with abundance of joy. But the churches of Macedonia show that you can have an abundance of joy even in deep poverty. But it says that their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So it talks about how they had deep poverty, but it abounded in their riches. Now, liberality actually means generosity. It means that they're overflowing, willing to give out liberally. Now, this is, not a, this is not a political statement. This is about the meaning of the word, is that they're willing to give beyond. So they were willing to give beyond, and it says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. So they were willing to give not just what they had, but beyond what they should have been able to give. Now, before I go further, I want to make something clear. Is this is not a tithing chapter. Tithing is a way that we can give to God. But Paul makes it very clear a few verses down. This is not a verse where Paul was encouraging the Corinthian church to give him more. See, Paul explains what it means to give to God the different ways to give to God, and how we can give to God. 
He says that the Macedonian church was able to give beyond their power, beyond their means. This reminds me of the story of the widow's might. And of the widow's might, that parable has a woman giving just a little bit, what could be a quarter nowadays, and her giving more than the man who put thousands upon thousands of dollars in modern currency in the tithes. That gives us a little hint at what Paul is getting at here. He says, Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. That we should take upon us this ministry, putting ourselves in the seat of the, the Corinthian church, taking upon us the ministry that the Macedonian church had, caring for others. And it says, And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So there's two things in that verse, and I want to really focus on verse 5 there. Is he says that they didn't give as we had hoped. Now, he's not saying they didn't give enough, that they didn't do enough. He's actually saying that they went beyond what Paul had ever hoped. They went beyond what Paul could have ever hoped from a church. But remember, they're in poverty. I can't imagine that they were accruing millions. They were in poverty, and yet they gave beyond what Paul had hoped. And he says this, that they didn't give just what they had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. I've seen some pastors get behind the pulpit. And fortunately, it hasn't been in our church, but I've seen some pastors get behind the pulpit and say that to bring a smile to the Lord's face, you got to add a few zeros to the check. You know, you have to make the church wealthy. You have to make, typically, it's the pastor wealthy. I was watching an interview of a pastor who's being interviewed from his private jet. And you see, that's not what tithing was ever meant to be about. Tithing was never meant to make the churches wealthy or to make the pastor wealthy. Tithing was a fruit of ourselves. See, when we give ourselves to the Lord, if you've only got 10 cents in your pocket, if you ever get in that situation where you've only got 10 cents in your pocket, and you can only give 10 cents, I promise you that person with only 10 cents in their pocket who gives 10 cents to the Lord just gave more than Elon Musk ever could. When we are struggling is when we test how much we give to the Lord. God is the creator of the universe. Does He need billions? Whatever God needs, He can get it just like that. So God doesn't ask from us to give as some sort of way of building His bank account. And that's why Paul explains that giving is not just about tithing. See, he lists a few different ways that we can give to the Lord. He says, Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. And he lists some of the ways that the Corinthian church had actually been doing great. He says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. See, when we look at giving to God, giving to God is not always from our pocket. I look around the sanctuary and I see so many people who have given to God in ways that you can't 
quantifying money. You can't put it in a pocket, you can't put it in a wallet, can't put it in a bank account, but they've given to God. Pastor used to speak of tithing your time. Tithing your time. See, I, I know people around here who tithe their time for even just simple things. Just picking up some trash when they see it. Or others who will clean up some areas that are dirty. Others who tithe their time outside of this church. Ones who go visiting to those who need to hear the gospel. Ones who will go visiting to those who already have Christ, but need encouragement and uplifting. See, I don't want any of us to think that giving to God is all about money. See, I've been in some times where that money got a bit tight. And I wasn't sure if I could give to God that time. But then I, I remembered, one, the Lord always provides. And two, I can always give even if I don't have any money. See, when we minister unto one another, when we care for one another, when we encourage one another, that is when we give to the Lord. The Lord doesn't want our money. And in a way, when we clean up, it's not that the Lord will give us great points for cleaning up after Him, not after God, but cleaning up after some messes. And it's not that the Lord gives us great points for reaching out to someone. But what the Lord cares about is that we gave ourselves to Him. God doesn't want money. God doesn't want work. God wants us. And when we give ourselves to God, then God's grace will flow through us. I will say that when we have given ourselves to God, we won't have to think, well, what can I do? What's the bare minimum to be in God's favor this week? Because I see that a lot. Not just in other people, but in myself. I found this a very convicting passage sometimes. And I would read through here any time I felt that I was not giving my all. There's a lot of times that we as humans want to do the bare minimum. It's not that we don't want to do anything, but we do just enough to be in God's good graces, and then we're good. Well, to make it to heaven, all you need to do is have faith. But we shouldn't live for heaven. And I want to make that, this may sound very strange, but I want to make this clear. We should not live for heaven. When we take every step, we should not take a step for heaven. Heaven was not meant to be an incentive, but a reward. An outpouring of God's love for those who do not live for heaven, but live for Him. There's a reason that Christ Himself fulfilled the law so that we would not be held to the 613 commandments. Because it started to become a task. Do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, and I will get to heaven. People forgot that they were not supposed to live for heaven, they were supposed to live for God. When you live for God, you will love your neighbor. When you live for God, you will be kind. When you live for God, your greed will go away. When you live for God, your hate and your envy will go away. Now, I'm not going to say that the moment you turn to Jesus that you're going to start being a perfect person. It just means that we're living for God in this way, but we're not living for God yet here. How can we hate someone while living for God? How can we cause division while living for God? 
See, this passage is not about tithing. I want to make that clear. This passage is not about tithing. This passage is about living for God. Now, when we live for God, we want to give to His ministry. We want to uplift that. But that's not always through tithing. See, if you see someone in need, someone who is isolated, someone who doesn't feel the grace of God at that moment, someone who doesn't feel the joy of God at that moment, you can live for the Lord by uplifting them. Some of the people who I think have honored God the most, some of them have lived in poverty their entire lives. Because any time they got wealth, they, give, they gave it away. Now, I'm not saying that everyone here should live in poverty, but we have to understand that it's not about a quota. God doesn't have a scoreboard up in heaven checking how much money this person has given, checking even how many hours this person spent in church, how many people this person spoke to about the gospel. When God's in heaven, He only has one thing that He checks. is are you living for Him or not? And the reason I said we shouldn't live for heaven is because when we live for heaven, God's already in heaven. So when we are living for heaven, we're living so that we get there. So that we get eternal life, right? But that's not living for God. If we are living so that we get eternal life, who are we living for? We are living for ourselves. And I have to admit, when I first, when I first accepted Jesus, that's the exact reason I accepted Him. I was seven years old and I heard about heaven and I heard about hell. And I sure didn't want to go to hell. And heaven sounded pretty nice. So I heard if you accepted Jesus, you would get to the good place and stay away from the bad place. And I would say that has brought souls to heaven. But it strips us of a joy here on earth. See, because from that moment on, from that moment on, I didn't actually really change. I later re-accepted Christ with my mother and with my father when I was about 12 years old. Because I recognized I didn't accept Jesus for the right reasons. And during those five years between then, things just went kind of downhill in my heart. I started to question things. What if I did the wrong thing? What if God's going to take away my reward now? What if God's going to take away heaven now? When you start living for a reward, you never know if that reward's going to go away. But if you start living for God, you know for a fact God will never go away. God will never lie to you. God will never steal from you. God will never hurt you. God will never forsake you. And God will never hate you. And we only have two options in our life. To love God who loved us, or to love the things that hate us. See, sin wants nothing more than to destroy us. Every sin was a device of the devil. Every sin was meant to destroy us, tear us apart, and pull us away from God. So we have a choice. What do we love? Do we love God or do we love sin? And let me get a little more specific here. Because a lot of times we think about sin. and We think sin is bad. But then when you bring up a sin, that's not always seen as bad. Not in our hearts at least. Here are a few sins that are so painfully common in churches. Even more so in the world, but I hate to say it, 
A lot of times the church is no different than the world. One of the sins, this is very, very common. I believe the term is people pleasing. I remember I was watching one of my favorite pastors preach. And I didn't realize this, but I was actually watching a video of someone reacting to the pastor. The pastor was preaching on sin. The pastor was preaching on, I believe it was adultery. And he was bringing up that adultery is very painful because someone who devoted their life to you, you decide to betray. And then this person chimed in and said, well, this is divisive, this is, you're going to scare people away from the church. And they ended with this phrase, the world is watching. That the world is watching. You know, that we should present ourselves in a way acceptable to the world. We should present ourselves in a way that the world would approve of. But the world isn't, it's not the devil and then Jesus and then the world's down here and they're fighting over it. The world's over here with the devil. The world is the enemy of God. Because God made this world for us, but then it got corrupted. It got filled with sin and it got destroyed and that world is now an enemy to everything from God. So if we start living because we want to be acceptable to the world, we're living to be acceptable to God's enemy. And people pleasing oftentimes doesn't mean doing the wrong thing. It just means not always doing the right thing. See, if I stand up here and every time I get behind this pulpit, I tell you, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus wants you to accept Him. All those are truth. All those are truth that Jesus died for us. That if we accept Him, we have accepted God and we will be with God in the next world. But if I don't tell you that you're leading down a road straight to destruction, can I truly say I'm living for God? God loves each and every one of us, but God tells me when I'm sinning. And God tells each and every one of you when you're sinning. It's not because God is mean. It's not because God is cruel. But because God is loving. I like to think back on when I was a child and my mother had a, quite a struggle trying to keep me away from dangerous things. I was a, for those who knew me when I was younger, I was quite the adventurous child. I was always doing things that would get me in trouble or in danger. I would hang around the oven too much and on the hot stove. And I probably gave my mom a big headache trying to keep me away from those. And I, I don't imagine, probably not every child, but I think most parents know what I'm talking about. Is it a struggle to keep your children from, I don't want to say destroying themselves, but to keep them from hurting themselves. And I'm sure a lot of children, let's say when I was climbing a tree and I was three years old because I had seen the older kids climbing a tree and I started trying to climb one. I sure thought my mom was the meanest there was because she told me not to climb. I said, what's wrong with climbing a tree? Well, I was three years old and would have probably landed right on my head. But looking back on that, that was my mother's love. Every parent has to show their love in ways that their children think is just mean. Parents have to show their love in ways that their children think is cruel. And God's no exception. He doesn't take bad things away from us. And a lot of times we could think, well, what's so wrong about this? Well, it's not our job to ask God why something is wrong. It's our job to trust God on why something is wrong. And that is what living above and beyond is. 
is living above and beyond isn't necessarily following this law, this law, and this law, and then for everything that God didn't specifically cover, live however you please. There's something about living for God that changes everything in our life. We don't need this covered if we're living for God. If I'm living for God, I don't need God to tell me not to steal. I'll look at something around here. There's this piece right here. This is something we actually use in the Wana. It's a little example of the armor of God. Now I like to imagine that if I was a child and I saw this, I would think it was pretty cool. Probably maybe you want to take it for myself, run around, have some fun with this. But this doesn't carry on into the next world. This doesn't advance God's kingdom. This doesn't advance our heart towards God. This is something that will pass away. And having grown older, it's more about money. It's more about money. It's more about having not those types of toys, but the cool toys like the fancy sports car. Or even nowadays, the fancy supercar. I remember I was being told about someone who was working on a so I think a Mustang engine. It's a Mustang V8 engine. And man, I got so jealous because I look at my car and it goes 0 to 60 in about 20 seconds. I was thinking about a Mustang V8 engine. That was the coolest thing to me. And though I still think that would be really awesome to have, I shouldn't live for that either. I shouldn't be envious of how others are blessed by God. Because in the end, if we're living for God, God will bless us in His own ways. And then I thought about it. God has blessed me in so many different ways. God has blessed me with a wonderful family growing up. God has blessed me with a wonderful wife. And God has not always blessed me with riches. But I would say if I had a choice between riches or those two things, I don't think riches are worth it. So you can't buy a good family. You can't buy love. And that's the most important thing about God. Is we can't buy His love. If you had a billion dollars, it wouldn't be worth it. You cannot buy God's love. You can't work hard enough to get His love. You can't do enough great things to get His love. God's love is given to you whether or not you live for Him. God's love is given to you whether or not you follow His commands. When we sin, God doesn't stop loving us. God seeks to pull us out of that sin because of His love. God will love us no matter how many times we turn against Him. And sin I want to make this clear. Sin is not just an oopsie. Sin is an attack on God. Sin is siding with God's enemies and attacking Him. And yet, no matter how many times we do that, God will still love us. God will still care for us. God will still support us. God will still comfort us. And most importantly, God still died for us. God saw the deepest, darkest sin you ever committed and still let them nail Him to that cross. So don't you think He deserves a little more than the bare minimum? We shouldn't live for the reward that God's giving us. Because God is giving that to us because we love Him. And we love Him because He first loved us. So if we live for God, if we live for Him, if we give ourselves to Him, that's the greatest gift we could ever give Him. 
And when we give ourselves to God, that will overflow in our life. That will overflow in every way we can give to God. That will overflow in every way we can devote ourselves to Him. If you're doing morning devotions, I know times where it's been like that for me where I've said, for example, in college, I'd say my first class is at 9, I'm waking up at 8, well... I got 55 more minutes to go. I'll just hit the snooze on the alarm. Devotions can wait. Or if I even do, it's a struggle. But I'll tell you this great blessing. You won't struggle. If you're truly living for God, you'll wake up excitedly. I get to be in His Word again. I get to read about what He did for us. Living for God is the best blessing that we can give to God and that God can give. No one who lives for themselves is ever truly free. We are in this world. We are not of this world. And if we want to be truly free in this world, we ought to follow the one who made it for us. So please, when you give, when you give your tithe, when you give your money. But when you give your time, you give your service. And when you give your heart, the most important of them all, you give yourself. So whatever way you give, please do not give out of requirement. Please do not give because you feel that this will make God love you more. Because I promise you this, it's impossible for God to love you more. When you are alone, when you are suffering, when you are struggling, there is no one who loves you more than God. I just ask that we give a little bit of that love back. That we don't see being a Christian as a job. But see being a Christian as adoption. And this is why, and this is the last verse I'll read, is verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. God gave everything up for us. God gave everything up so that we could have a taste of His love. So please, don't follow Jesus for heaven. You'll get there. Don't follow Jesus because you think He'll give you that car or that mansion. Follow Jesus because though we may be poor on this earth, He has made us rich. Rich in heart, rich in spirit and rich in Him. It's about sincerity. It's about living the way that we say we do. You don't all have to do the greatest deeds. You don't all have to win a million souls like Billy Graham. But if you live for Him, you'll take joy in every time you get to give for the Lord. Every time you get to serve for the Lord, and every time you get to live for the Lord, that will be a blessing that you will never regret. So please, I'm going to invite anyone to come forward. The altar is open. If any of you desire to live for the Lord stronger, if any of you desire to be strengthened for the Lord, if any of you don't feel that you have salvation, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to open this up right now. Who here would like to live for the Lord stronger today? I'm going to pray for us all. I'm just going to pray that the Lord works, us, works that in our hearts. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray that you strengthen everyone here. Let us live stronger for you. Let us 
live for you, truly live for you. Let us understand that your love flows out no matter what we do and that you don't want our riches, you don't want our strength, you want our love. And if we can show our love through our riches, that's one way. But if we can show our love through our time, that's another. But Lord, we ask that we always live for you to show our love to you because you showed your love to us. I pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen.